so uh, I'm going to pretty much dive straight in. We're doing this series at the moment called Sanger Akshita Classics, where each of us on the team takes a lecture by our founder, Sanger Akshita, that's him on the shrine there, that we particularly like or value, and we just unpack that, uh, sum it up a bit, riff off it, give our own uh, reflections. Uh, so, uh, Amelie over next week's doing a, uh, a really famous one called A Taste of Freedom. Uh, I'm doing one tonight called The Myth of the Return Journey. But I'll say more about myths and Sangha Akshita and so on later. Uh, what I'm going to do first is just go straight into the story that this lecture is based on. Okay. So, you have to imagine that we're back in a kind of beginningless past. We don't even know how long ago it is. It's so far in the past that this story is set. And there is a father and a son. And it simply says in the story that the son goes away for a long time. Okay, So the father and the son are separated. Uh, he goes away for a long time, uh, travels about from one country to another, uh, and is, is a long way from the father. The father, it says, also moves about a bit from place to place. Uh, but that's where the similarities end. Uh, the father becomes a successful merchant. He becomes rich. He settles somewhere in the end. Uh, he undertakes all sorts of business activities, starts doing well. The Rolling Stone gathers moss. He becomes wealthy, a good reputation, uh, respected, materially successful and so on. The son, meanwhile, uh, scratches around in place after place, year after year, just getting together enough uh, to buy clothes and food. Okay, we'll come back to that. But he's, he's just uh, putting hand to mouth, the son. Okay. And during this time, the father, of course, is very sad that his son is not with him. And he's always thinking of the son. Okay? So he never forgets about him. Every day he thinks about him. And after some time has passed, he also thinks, I would like to give him some of what I've gained. Uh, it's not just a material security thing, although that would have been very, very important um, back then as well. Uh, I've said I don't know how long ago it was, but I assume <laughs> pre-welfare state and all that. So uh, he wants to hand on what he's amassed, uh, and for his son to inherit. Okay, but he doesn't know where he is. Uh, he's always thinking of him, though. Anyway, you might be able to guess what's coming. It so happens that their locations coincide, that the son, on his continuing meanderings, stumbles into the city where the father lives. Okay? And on his way to another day as a journeyman or day labourer or whatever, he walks past the doorway of the father's house and he sees a huge uh, mass of people around a very, very rich man, a scene of opulence. And it's very beautiful. Uh, I might even... No, I don't have it with me, the description. Anyway, um, he's sitting under canopies of silks and jewels, uh, the father, this is. He's being fanned by a servant with a yak's tail, which is a sign of... Uh, royalty or even divinity, uh, godlikeness. Uh, lots of attendants, people are gathering round with bundles of paper, bundles of money, they've got business to transact with him, uh, even bribes to try and give him uh, a, a real crowd. Okay. Uh, and the son uh, sees him. In fact, they see each other, uh, and again, they have different experiences. The father immediately recognises the son, the son, all he sees is something very, very alien to him, okay? that for a long time he's been uh, distant from, i.e. Uh, wealth, even comfort, um, society, people around him, and so on, and he feels afraid. And uh, the father, who doesn't know this yet, sends two of his men after him. Th this is his opportunity he says please track down that man and bring him here okay the son becomes more afraid as these two people follow him starts to run um, 
and then is so afraid that he falls into a faint and hits the ground unconscious. Okay. The father realises, okay, he's not used to wealth uh, and splendour as I am. Uh, I'm going to have to approach this a different way. So he says to his two men, he says, tell him he can go wherever he likes. He's, he's free, nothing's wrong. Um, he can relax, he can carry on on his way. So the son does that. Uh, the father finds two other men and he, of his staff, and he picks some lowly-looking ones, okay, some, some riffraff from, his, uh, from among his henchmen, um, and says, uh, go and find my son. This is where we think he is. Uh, don't tell him I've sent you. All you do is offer him double wages to come and work at the palace. So this works. The two guys go and find him in the poor quarter of the town say, we're going to pay you double, and it's to clear a massive heap of dirt. That's the job. Okay. So the ploy works. The son comes. He sees that he's in this place that he was in before, but luckily all he's been asked to do is clear away a huge pile of dirt behind the mansion. You can, you can see little symbols everywhere in this probably, can't you? Okay. So this is okay, this is familiar enough. He, he gets his shovel. The other two guys are working with him. They say, we're working with you, it's double pay, it's pretty good, you know, join in. Okay, so they start shoveling the dirt, I guess from one pile into another pile or something. <laughs> or dispersing it, maybe. Um, and so this, this goes a bit better. And the father can see him uh, from a, one of the palace windows. Okay? So he can keep an eye on how this is going. After a little while, it's been going well. Uh, he, he goes and finds him himself, okay? So now he doesn't need the, uh, the grubby henchmen to do the approach. He, after he thinks the son is relaxed enough, coming and going to at least the palace grounds in the pile of dirt, he approaches him himself and says, you've been doing really well. Uh, we're pleased with you. If you need anything, just tell me. If you need extra clothing, extra money, uh, just tell me. Uh, if we're not paying you enough, tell me, we'll pay you more. Uh, and just keep, keep it up. <laughs> keep up the good work. Okay. So it continues to go well. Uh, and he's living, the son, in a grass hovel. Okay. So again, nice and familiar, nothing too fancy, shoveling the dirt. Mm -hmm. The father goes to see him every now and then, uh, starts to just befriend him a little bit, gets him a bit familiar with a few of the goings-on of this mini palace society gives him a few extra errands, a few extra things to do. By and by, the son becomes the manager of the estate. Okay? I'm fast-forwarding a bit now. He's still living in his grass hovel, okay? but the father has said, I want you to manage my affairs. You know, he, he takes on a bit more each time. Um, the son does well, manages his affairs. Eventually, we're at a point where the son comes and goes from the palace at will, because he needs to transact with the father. Uh, who he thinks is simply his boss, quite a generous one, um, quite an unusual one, but his boss, uh, comes and goes freely, uh, and eventually, um, uh, yeah, the father's made him the manager, and notices one more crucial thing, which is he sees that the son is starting to become ashamed of his previous poverty, okay, and has started aspiring to be wealthy himself. None of this is to be read literally, as we'll see later. Okay? So uh, it's not saying poverty is something to be ashamed of, but the son feels, I want to climb out of the situation I've been in. Okay? Uh, I would like what I can see around me. Sure enough, the father starts to fall ill, uh, knows that the time is ripe because the son has had this thought, calls all of his staff, all of his attendants, people from the town, uh, ordinary people, merchants, priests, gather around him and does uh, the big reveal. Says, this in fact is my son. He is the sole inheritor of all of my wealth. Um, uh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> and great, uh, great celebrations. The son is amazed, accepts his inheritance uh, and the father dies. Okay. So the son's become a rich man. Okay. Um, 
So that's the myth of the return journey, which is told in the middle of a thing called the White Lotus Sutra. It's actually a story within a story. It's one of those ones with a frame, but I thought it'd be complicated to do the frame and then the story. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the story. Um, we'll, we'll come back to the frame, I think. Um, what Sangharachta says about this is that uh, we, there are reasons we need and use myths because, in a sense, there are conceptual points being made here. Okay. But that's only a certain level of things. We also probably need to uh, take teachings that can be sometimes embodied in concepts and start to experience them and enact them and even live them, okay? And stories and myths allow us to do that because they are also not simply a string of ideas or events, but something that hopefully we can allow to affect our being and that we actually start to live more from. So if these images have any power, and I think they do, it's because they will resonate with us on a level beyond simply saying, here's a good idea, and here's a healthy thing to follow, and here's a beneficial practice to take up, if you see what I mean. Because much as that can keep us going for a little while in spiritual life, we'll need a larger myth within which uh, to work if we want to feel our, our life's actually going to flourish from it, rather than just picking up um, a few good ideas from apps or Buddha centres or wherever we, wherever we get them. And he says, human life is so deep and complex that there are dozens and dozens of ways you can look at it. And probably you need to pick up one or another at different times to illustrate it to yourself and dramatise what's going on. Okay? And there's lots and lots of different uh, ways of doing this. So that's part of how you get the great myths. Uh, the stories that are told and retold and can be almost eerily similar between cultures uh, that may or may not even have been in communication with each other, the great myths of, of human culture. So, for example, one way you can tell the story of what we're striving for in our life is conflict. Uh, you can tell the drama of human life as uh, conflict. In, an example he mentions is Paradise Lost, where uh, you've got not just the fall of Adam and Eve, but before that basically a war between heaven and hell. I don't know if you've read Paradise Lost, but it's quite warlike, a lot of it. Um, the archangels are fighting Satan and his armies, whole armies. Um, and it's a huge drama, basically, between the dark and the light. Uh, and as soon as I saw that, I thought, OK, a, a slightly more contemporary example is Star Wars. I don't know. Um, <laughs> some of those films are actually from the 1970s, so I know it's not that, not that recent. And some of them, I thought, were not so good. Um, but some of them are. Anyway, you might remember from Star Wars that it's a struggle between the dark and the light, and it's never over. And uh, while that also allows them to stretch out the franchise and keep making movies, <laughs> I think there's also something really quite true in it. Because I don't know if in our world system, good or evil, either of them will ever eliminate the other. You see what I mean? And so part of the reason I think, you know, something that might be okay, it might have its cheesy moments in its big budget obviousness, but a, a, a true or poignant moment at the end of a film like a Star Wars film might be that the struggle does continue, if you see what I mean, because on the level of our world, neither of those, good or evil, will probably wipe each other out for good, I imagine. So that's a kind of conflict way of telling uh, the drama of our life, of our existence. Interesting, another example he gives is the problem. I didn't see this one coming, but he says you can tell it as a problem. Uh, maybe you could say dilemma or quandary. Um, one of his examples is uh, Hamlet. Uh, Hamlet, uh, if you know the story, entails quite an indecisive man, actually a chronically indecisive person. That's part of the uh, drama going on there. But what he basically can't decide between is uh, action with all of the risks and conflict that will bring, or knowing something dark and troubling and keeping it to himself with the internal pain that that will bring, hence to be or not to be. 
You see what I mean? He, he can't decide whether to act or not. Um, so he's got a, he's got a problem. Um, so you can tell it as conflict, you can tell it as a problem. Uh, this story tells it as a journey. That's another of the classic myths, isn't it? The Greek epics, for example, are journeys. All sorts of things happen along the way. Uh, lucky this, this one's uh, shorter and simpler. But it's called the return journey, so that's important. All of the wanderings before coinciding with the father again are, uh, well, they're the introductory line or two. They, they, they're not so important. What this is, is the return journey, okay, which we'll be uh, coming back to. So to go back to the father and the son, uh, and that beginning, which I know I said doesn't matter terribly, but it is how the whole thing is initiated, they're separated. Okay? And it doesn't tell you why, it just says the, the son goes away for a long time. Uh, and given that we're in the realm of working on the mind here and Buddhist practice, whether you've heard about that for a week or two or some years, uh, what do you think that might be suggesting, separation? Or what do you think might be being separated? Can you, can you guess? In this father and son figure. Mind and body. Mind and body, okay, interesting. Mind and body. Is it like, um, kind of your your mind from true reality. So it's kind of like the father's sat with sort of like reality and then we've sat with. That's kind of what I was thinking. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, so the sun is separated from true reality. Hmm. Yeah. Any other proposals? Uh, the, like the fixed and separate self. So well, What's the, being separate? Uh -huh. Well, the delusion of fixed and separate self. Uh, I guess it being... Like the father is our true self. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And where's the fixed and separate one? In? Well, the, the, the idea that the sun okay. is, exists in a way. Ah. Mm. Could be a distinction. Yeah, quite subtle. Yeah. yeah. But you said that the father is the true self. Yeah, so that's a sort of enlightened state. So it's right. Good, yeah. I won't give anything away yet, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's why it's quite interesting because the father acquires two. So surely the father, the father in the story acquires. Uh huh. Yeah, the father becomes wealthy. He, as well. he has a journey of acquisition. Yeah. Which surely, total awareness, there's no acquisition. It just is. Right. So what would you say? What would you say the father and son are? Because that's a good point. It's an interesting point. Um. Yeah, you've, you've skated out onto the answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I like it. No, no, no. no, no you, 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 I, I, I get it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very, it's that, that's, that's quite a deep point. Um, because I, I would have said the, the same, though, the mm. separation of awareness to, yeah, to the analogy, identification of self. But. Mm, yeah, the analogy would be easier if the father didn't go anywhere yeah. and was rich from the beginning of the story, wouldn't it? Yeah. And, and for reasons. I hope we'll see. Uh, he also travels and all, and becomes wealthy from having not been. Yeah, yeah, good. Anyone else? Okay. Does the father represent the Dharma? Hmm. Three jewels. The Dharma. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what would the son be if the father's the Dharma? Um. Hmm. The person before becoming enlightened or hmm. before encountering the Dharma. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, good. Okay, um, I'll, I'll say what Sangha Rakshita says, not because it's the only interpretation I imagine. Personally, I find it very persuasive and eventually uh, quite moving. Um, and y you've, you've all touched on it in different ways, I think. He says that these are basically the higher and lower self. All of this language could be queried, of course. You might find problems with that, or it might not immediately appeal. Like I say, personally, I find it uh, persuasive, the higher and the lower self. Um, so let's just take this a little bit further. 
if those, supposing we know what those are, if those become separated, what, what would you say is happening there? Or what state would you describe that as? Sankhara. Um, say a bit more. Sankhara, like the, yeah. um, like the, what, when, uh, like when your mind goes into a state of like agitation or craving, mm. and it mm. uh, starts creating new, um, it's kind of the realm of the mind. Yeah. Um, just, okay. Yeah. A mind in craving or agitation. That yeah. uh, causes different agitation and more craving and more. Um, or more, yeah, it's like a, I don't know, like a, a vicious circle of mind, mm -hmm. in a sense. Okay, so you're saying that's what happens when the higher and lower selves become separated. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's why they are separated. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Any other descriptions of what's going on? <laughs> Anyone who hasn't spoken yet? Kind of alienation. Alienation, yeah, yeah, that's the word I have got in my mind as well. Yeah, and I think you were getting at that as well, probably. Um, that when the high, the higher and lower self uh, become separated, we're in an alienated state. What what might the, the higher self be? What 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 might Sangha actually mean there? Isn't it um, who we? Um, will be, mm. it's an as I, I can't see it as an aspiration to be, um, yeah, that's, that's your potential. Yes, <clears throat> interesting, yeah, yeah, potential. I, I'll go with potential uh, because you said at first what we will be, which hopefully is true, but there's also something in the present, I'd say that, well, personally, I, you know, I'll, I'll say how I see it. You've got a higher and lower self probably operating all the time. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they they're both, they're both exist in the present. Like I say, this is quite provisional language, but just going with it for now, you've got, uh, a, we've got a side of us that's probably more aspirational, even a side of us that already knows what it aspires to. What I mean is a potentiality in us that, um, that is what we will achieve. If you sort of mean the potential is already in us of what we could achieve. Potential is quite a subtle idea. I'm not even sure I understand it myself because whether it's in the future or the present is, is, is tricky to know. <laughs> and if something's there in potential, it's not there actually and it's not there yet and it might never be there. Mm -hmm. So potential is quite subtle, but there's a higher and lower self, let's just say. So what, what would the lower self be? If the higher self is what we aspire to, what of the lower self be? <coughs> what we are now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, I sent that out to my, yeah. yeah. Anything else? What the lower self might be or do? I guess the uh, craving, greed, aversion, instant gratification. Yeah. Now, now, now. Mm. Mm. Give me a yum, yum, yum. Yeah. Yeah, what the tradition calls the poisons, greed, hatred and delusion. I think that's, that's probably what the lower self is operating on. The reason I just slightly paused when you said what we are now is this slightly tricky question, that what we are now is probably some combination of the two where you can't even always draw a line between them. Um, maybe even Amelie Odin's announcement uh, this evening has got um, something of the different selves in it that will come out at different times and dominate at different times and have different things to be learned from them. But basically, the father and the son are the higher and lower self. Uh, and this is a story about alienation. Okay. Um, interestingly, he says, uh, it probably doesn't matter that much when the alienation started or how which you can see in the story, it just says the sun went away for a long time. And in the sutra, that, that's it, that's the sentence, the sun went away for a long time. And then you start hearing about how he came back into contact with the father. Um, and I thought I'd just pause on that, because if we start to think about alienation, that's language that overlaps with probably quite a lot of secular uh, thought and discipline. 
and it might be tempting to get quite involved in how did we become alienated from that higher self. Okay? We know that we want growth, uh, fulfilment. You know, in our better moments, we don't just want pleasure and gratification. We know that actually we'd like to deepen our mind. Um, and yet, every day, in different ways, we'll either subtly or grossly undermine that with uh, repetitive, uncreative habits uh, to a greater or lesser extent. Yeah? He says it's not very important how that split began. Okay? Um, and it's probably even an echo of that, the fact that this story is happening so deeply far back in time that we just don't need to know. Do you see what I mean? It's like the historical context is not relevant, which is why it's a myth, not a piece of history. Okay? So it's alienation. Um, uh, yeah. So the lower self, which is the sun, to carry on with our uh, analysis of the story, the lower self, he says, is need-motivated. You remember that the sun scratches around for years just getting clothing and food that the higher self is growth orientated. Uh, maybe that's enough to add in for now, just to give another couple of reflections, because hopefully you can relate to this. Uh, you get up in the morning, you've got good intentions. Um, personally, I find I've got, got a, a clearer, more innocent type of energy in the morning, and the day looks quite innocent and kind of aspirational. And as it goes on, that can break down. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you need to sort of recover bits of it, but also come into, I don't know, a bit of a creative compromise for the time being, don't you? Uh, not give up just because you haven't had this sort of perfect day like something out of an advert, which you realise was a bit naive, because uh, life happens. Um, but you've got a need-motivated side and a growth-motivated side. And hopefully the growth-motivated side can take the need-motivated side around a bit, lead it around, or attract it back. Yeah. And my example for this always is coming to a Buddhist centre. Um, you can even feel it when you sit down to meditate, think, you think, brilliant idea, I've seen it in all the adverts, and bang, you know, you're somewhere else. You don't care about meditation, you hate meditation, you can't wait to get out, or you're just making plans for tomorrow really extensively and think, what was the point in that? I thought I was going to meditate. But at least the growth orientated part of you got you there. At least hopefully you remember it a handful of times and it taps on the sort of eggshell insistently enough that you stay somewhat aware of it and in dialogue with it. And I think that's a really important part of what's happening when we do something like come to a meditation class or a center. I first came here, I think out of a need really, I needed well, this is what I thought. I needed meditation to sort out a situation in my mind. I, I mean, the situation of my mind. Um, uh, I was stressed and unhappy and kind of unwell, um, a bit lost, as I would now say. And meditation appealed to me as a tool to sort of manage that better. And probably, I didn't tell myself this, but probably just be a bit happier. That, that's probably what I needed at the time. Interestingly, within just a couple of weeks, uh, I was developing a taste for the spiritual life. Uh, immediately, for example, I wanted to go on retreats. Um, I was reading books about Buddhism, I was very inspired. And I just stepped gradually more and more into things. Um, it became more and more of a sort of framework for my uh, life. Um, but that, that took some time. I'm, I'm, I'm telescoping it. But what I really wanted to uh, draw out is that something got me here. Uh, a whole other huge vista opened up then, bit by bit. Um, the growth-orientated aspect of me could then come out because it was being nourished so much more. Okay? Maybe there's little echoes here of the sun starting to come in contact with the wealth at least in proximity to the palace, and then even going in, in and out of the palace a bit. Um, so, uh, perhaps the lower self is not so unaware as all that. Sometimes it can be in dialogue with the higher self and do something that's really in our interest. Okay? Um, you know, sometimes you do just act in your own interest, quite spontaneously, 
which is quite often what there is to it, I think, is one of the things that the lower self does is ruminate and rationalise and basically put things in the way. So sometimes we give the example of wanting to give, you know, wanting to give money to a cause, for example. And if you don't do it straight away, you start just having a little discussion with yourself about why actually that would be rather difficult and why we should maybe give 100 instead of 200, maybe 20 instead of 100, and by the next day we've forgotten. You sort of I mean, if you allow that part of your mind to come in and sort of wear it down. But sometimes if you, um, if you just act, the, the higher self, I think, to use this metaphor, has found a little crack and let through it just for a moment, yeah. or shone through it if it's, if it's light. So you might, you might be able to think of moments in your own life story where your higher self has grabbed the lower self and said, come on, we're going, <laughs> we're going to do something that helps, helps both of us, in a way. So the, the sort of paradox is that we're alienated from the higher self. That is, I think, the human situation. I and mean, it's not just two or three of us, if you sort of mean that. That is the human situation. We're alienated from the higher self. Um, but paradoxically, the higher self is us as well. Okay? So somehow those two are trying to come back together. And you, you can definitely see that in the story, can't you? Okay. So the sons come back into contact with the father accept something familiar, which is shoveling dirt. Uh, possibly that represents some sort of psychological work, some sort of basic psychological work. It, to go back to my own story, since I'm uh, telling it, I think I did need to get a little bit more healthy and happy, if you see what I mean. And there's some sort of psychological work to do there, and a lot of the initial effects of meditation were putting me in more contact with my emotions, probably settling the whole of my being down a bit, um, putting me back in touch with things I enjoyed, probably back in touch with my physical experience, um, remembering more of my life. Uh, in my early meditation life, I had just lots of spontaneous memories. So sort of tendrils sort of stretched back out from the present to sort of touch bits of, I don't know, not just my past, sort of lots of people I'd known and remembered and all of that, something just sort of breathes out. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, so he's shoveling dirt. So probably getting out of the way some of the basic negativity, okay? And that's, that's important. Um, and uh, he doesn't stay on it forever. So the higher self doesn't direct him, notice, to another pile of dirt when he's finished the first one. Okay? and doesn't keep him endlessly in that, even though it might be useful to have one member of your staff who's always uh, <laughs> shoveling dirt. So what the higher self does is he stays in communication, the father, I should say, and draws him further towards the wealth. That first stage, I'm going to say, is developing self-awareness. So that's what I'm saying I was doing, is in the first months of my meditation life, just getting a bit more self-aware, okay? the habits of my mind. So some of the more positive ones that I hadn't been aware of, certainly some more of the negative ones. Um, basic psychological work, self-awareness. But then you notice the sun, the sun starts going in and out of the mansion. Um, that's the next stage. Anyone want to guess what's going on there? What might that represent? If we've done some basic psychological work, become more aware of ourselves, shoveled out a lot of the grosser Negativity in the form of the heap of dirt. Yeah. Glimpses of happiness. So Glimpses of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Could be. Going on retreat. Going on retreat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why do you say that? Uh, just uh, well, I suppose like going deeper into your experience mm. more regularly. Mm. Yeah. My example for this one. Well, I'll say Sangharachta says this is the scholar. Um, uh, I think there, are, there seemed to be a lot of scholars involved in his movement at first, and he was looking to sort of burst their bubble sometimes. I don't think that's so much of an issue for us now. Uh, this is, but he's saying that's like a Buddhist scholar going in and out of the teaching, uh, being very familiar with it, visiting it all, but staying immune from it on another level and still living in the grass hovel. Um, my example is a little bit more like yours. I thought it's a bit like having a meditation practice. I think going on retreats better, actually because 
you're getting glimpses of a higher vision. Yeah. So that is distinct from the basic psychological work. I think that's noticeable. Okay, so we've shoved a lot of dirt, and now we might be starting, it probably does happen, especially on retreat, doesn't it, to get glimpses of something really meaningful, and maybe even starting to touch uh, our potential, uh, as you mentioned earlier, <coughs> our high potential, and becoming familiar. I think the nice thing in the story here is that the son starts feeling at ease. That's the main thing that's happening emotionally in the drama, isn't it? He starts feeling at ease walking in and out of the house. I guess he's got a key, or there isn't a key. He just goes in when he wants um, to fulfil uh, business. But he keeps coming out again and going to sleep uh, back in the grass hovel. Then the father says, uh, I want you to take on the management of the whole estate. So the father remains the owner, but he says, you're the boss. What might that mean? Taking control of your life a bit more. Taking control of your life. In that more. direction. Mm. Mm. Yes. Taking control of your life. I'd probably put more in the initial stage, actually, of shoveling the dirt, because I think that self-awareness mm. work has that effect. Mm. Um, yeah. Going for refuge. Ah. Committing yourself to mm. the journey. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Why, why are you linking that with managing the affairs of the estate? Well, if we take that literally, mm. then that becomes his life. His mm. there's, there's not really much. That becomes a focus of his life. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So he's taken on that sort of career as the steward of the estate. Ah, yeah, and it's a responsibility. I've, I've just realised that that might be the link. So you mentioned going for refuge, uh, meaning orientating your life towards the ideals more and more and probably making some sort of commitment to that. Yeah, so there's a commitment, yeah, and a responsibility. Yeah, very good. Uh, what Bante says here is that this is the stage of the mystic. Um, so the mystic who has more regularly... Uh, visionary experiences in meditation, communes with something beyond the senses on a regular basis, uh, that's this steward of the estate. So somebody who is now quite at ease, uh, maybe even authoritative with the spiritual riches that are represented by the, the wealth of the man. Um, another parallel occurred to me when I was preparing this talk. So Sangha actually didn't say this, just my little idea. But I thought that what we call teaching the Dharma, like teaching meditation or giving a talk, teaching's not such a good word for it, but it occurred to me that that was a little bit like handling the wealth, if you see what I mean, because you're tasked with, well, well you're handling it, you handle all these books, you, you pick up texts and teachings, and you've got a, some sort of responsibility to uh, hand them uh, to others, or at least try to put them across uh, so there's a lot of responsibility and you're handling something but you still definitely don't own it um, unless I suppose you're talking about an enlightened teacher you, you start getting used to handling it but it's in a sense it's, 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 it's no more yours than anybody else's yeah. um, okay so the story really culminates in the death scene I think, and I, I do find this rather touching because I think we go here from the emotional drama into something beyond the human. So I'll, I'll say why there. It can sound at the end of the story as though a poor man's become a rich man, uh, but we're well versed now in the fact that these riches are spiritual riches, okay? They're of a mind less and less concerned with itself. Uh, more and more able to act uh, out of concern for others, uh, generous, open-hearted, but not just having good ethical qualities, um, really abiding in them and having to some extent realised them. Okay, the son is getting closer and closer to this. And then what happens? That the father passes in the inheritance 
and dies. So the son has become the rich man. Uh, so the lower and the higher self have come together. Okay? You could say the father's no longer needed because his function is completely fulfilled. I think if you see a death like that in a story, it's probably not a tragedy. It means that the role that that person had in the drama, um, like when they kill someone off in a soap, maybe, <laughs> means what they were there to give to the story, they've given. Okay? The father's given uh, the riches. Now he can die. Um, I think actually, back down at the human level, there are uh, stories like that of when people have done what they needed to do, they actually let go of life. Certainly the case in the Buddha's life story. When he felt that he had said what he could to everybody and checked that they didn't have anything more they needed to ask him, uh, he let go of life uh, and died. So I find this striking because, well, I said I found it moving. That's because the son has come back to the father. The father has got what he wants and they are reunited. So there's a kind of human drama. But I think with this matter of the lower and higher self joining, you, it uh, takes off into something beyond the human. And in another way, within each human. Okay, so the real task that we're undertaking is trying to bring that lower and higher self together more and more fully. So not, not just so that they're in the same town, not just so that they're in dialogue. Hopefully they're working together by now. By the time we're meditating regularly, coming to a Buddhist centre, they're probably, probably in decent relationship to each other and they might need to stay so for a long time. Eventually they join and there's no difference at all. Uh, so there's a kind of complete union of qualities and no more distinction to be made. No more conflict, no more difference. Uh, a kind of completely harmonised mind. And that is the riches that the lower self has been journeying towards. At first, without even knowing that that's happening. And then being gradually drawn on, and then more and more consciously cultivated, and then, uh, wham, you know, inherited. <laughs> now the inheritance metaphor uh, you see elsewhere in Buddhism, part of what this is getting at is that that fully realised mind, someone mentioned reality earlier, that fully realised mind is, in one way of looking at it, our full spiritual inheritance. Okay? This is another way we can use myth. There's one myth of the spiritual life in which you just work towards the ideal. Okay, you, you see the Buddha, you think, that's a worthy ideal, I'm going to work my way towards it. Probably that won't sustain us all the way, uh, because it's always willed, and always in comparison with something that we're not. So you can see the alienation in there, if you see what I mean, eventually. So that, that myth of self-development, it's not to knock that, we probably need it for a long time. Active cultivation of mindfulness, a meta, generosity, etc., but eventually it will dry out if we just push and push, trying to become better and better. Uh, because like I say, we're always, well, it's always dual. There's always you and something you want to be, if you see what I mean, in there, in contradistinction. So another myth that needs to come in, which Amal Yogan was hinting at in the first half, if you're in here, is that you can believe that eventually spiritual riches are actually coming to you. And they truly, on the deepest human level, they are your due. They are your real inheritance. So it's not now like an unevenly distributed world in which there's an occasional rich person anxious to hand the wealth to the sun. Actually, every human has the natural, full inheritance of spiritual riches. That, on the other hand, doesn't mean that there's nothing we need to do, that it's just coming to us probably obviously. There's loads that we need to do on that level. But those two things, that journeying back towards and that natural inheritance, probably both of them need to be in play for us not to force ourselves, always be comparing, narrowing around a goal, uh, and so on. So the more we go into spiritual life, the more we'll need to, as we were doing in the meditation here earlier, tap into the fact that 
positive qualities already exist. We are not really alien from them. Uh, we've just put lots of things in the way. If you see what I mean, we've put our unskillful, uncreative habits in the way. Okay, so it's subtle. That's why we're in the realm of myth, because neither one is simply the answer. Just develop yourself or just inherit. If you see what I mean, they're equally useless as sound bites. Um, but they both can be myths that can contain our spiritual life. Okay. So, one more thing on that uh, inheritance. Um, when we see good qualities outside of us, and we come into relation with something like an idea of Buddhism, or maybe even just a Buddhist center for now, and think there are some experienced Buddhists there, or people who've been meditating 10, 20, 30 years, and I'm not like that. That's a phase in this journey as well, um, uh, which Sangha Akshita calls religious projection. Now, that's a bit technical and funny sounding. All he means is that we're still seeing it as outside of ourselves. And he's not knocking it. He says that that's a good thing, because at least then we are seeing uh, positive spiritual qualities and want to work towards them. It's just that eventually we will need to stop seeing them as outside of ourselves and realise that they're our inheritance. Does that make sense? That, and that he said in a theistic religion, that's what you'll get. Uh, he would say, for example, that the Christian God is a religious projection out of the human onto uh, a kind of mystic totality outside of us that has all sorts of qualities we don't have. And in most of the Christian tradition, as far as I can see, that we can't hope to have. There might have been Christian mystics originally who were looking for something more like union uh, with God, but uh, I don't think we hear much about that nowadays. Anyway, he calls that a sort of projection, which I think is very, I don't know, it lightens the whole matter for me. He's just saying you're putting it outside of yourself, and eventually you need to reclaim it and withdraw it back into yourself. Okay, maybe now I'll just finish by saying... Uh, what the frame for the story was. So, um, this is a Mahayana Sutra, so it's from the great poetic, metaphorical uh, phase, fantastical phase of Buddhism. And the Buddha is preaching to a giant assembly of thousands of Buddhas and thousands and thousands of Bodhisattvas. And he predicts one of his disciples to full and perfect enlightenment. Okay? And some of the other disciples, elders, uh, rejoice and feel very happy because they know that full and perfect enlightenment is one step further than what you could, what you could call simply enlightenment. And without going more into that, he's saying not just freeing yourself from suffering, but you can uh, work to deliver all others from suffering and then become enlightened yourself. And this is the type of enlightenment that this disciple will achieve and they all rejoice and realise that they've been contented with a narrower spiritual ideal. And then they spontaneously tell the story of the myth of the return journey, which is a sort of illustration of the greater riches available if we don't just practice for ourselves. They're saying that uh, in the drama of that sutra, we've been trying to sort of get out of our suffering and eliminate negative states uh, and do well spiritually but now the Buddha is revealing again uh, that you can work for the good of all beings, uh, what's called the Bodhisattva ideal. And because this is the world of the Bodhisattva ideal, they rejoice and tell this story where the much greater riches are uh, coming to us if we seek that type of enlightenment and that type of natural inheritance, which is to start with something like psychological work, um, eventually be going in and out of the temple, on retreat, familiarising ourselves, whatever it is, uh, taking ownership of it and then inheriting it fully is the greatest riches that the tradition is saying uh, are available. So it's not even just for ourselves anymore. That's the, real, um, that's the real frame of the story. You've got this myth, this return journey, all of that uh, drama. And what the disciples of the Buddha are really rejoicing in is saying, this is not even for us in the end, it's for everybody who could want it. And if everybody cultivated that kind of 
wish in their heart uh, how much richer uh, the world will be, not just for one inheritor, uh, but for everybody, for all of us. Okay, uh, I think I'll leave it there. Uh, that was the myth of the return journey. Um, uh, I hope that gives you some sort of flavour for one of the great kind of chapters of Buddhism um, and maybe a taste of what we do here at this uh, class if you're new to it. So I think ne next week Amelie Oden's doing A Taste of Freedom, so do come and hear Amelie Oden talk about A Taste of Freedom uh, next week. Um, well, I won't say, won't say more about that. Uh, he, can, he can reveal it. Um, but yeah, I hope to, hope to see you then. And uh, as always, we uh, really appreciate any donations you can make. The classes are free, uh, but if you'd like to put something in the bowl and can, we always, always appreciate that. Yeah, I hope to see you again at the class. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.